Hi, this is Dr. L, and this is an introductory video lecture on viral life. We'll talk about what viruses are, a little bit about the different kinds of viruses that exist, what viral life cycles look like, and the flu is an example of a viral disease. Viruses are small, obligate, intracellular parasites. They have one or more chromosomes. Those chromosomes are made of DNA or RNA. Those chromosome, that chromosome or those chromosomes are wrapped in a protein coat called a capsid, C-A-P-S-I-D, and then sometimes that is wrapped in an envelope of plasma membrane essentially stolen from the previous host cell called an envelope. Viruses do not have cytoplasm, they do not have cell walls or their own cell membranes or organelles of any sort, so they are different than cellular life. They're called obligate intracellular parasites because the word obligate means to be obligated to or to have to do something, and the thing that they have to do is to be inside or intracellular to their host, so they can only replicate when they are inside their host, and their host has to be a cellular organism. Often that, in, that um, relationship is parasitic, meaning it harms the host and benefits the virus, and so hence they often are also called parasites. When they are outside of their host cells, they are referred to as virions or particles, and in that state they're really not living because they have no ability to self-replicate or influence or perform any sort of metabolism. They are not shown on the tree of life that describes all cellular organisms and the reason for that is viruses are not cellular life forms. Instead, all of the organisms that could be mapped onto the three domain tree of life shown here can contain one or more viruses specific to those organisms. So when we look at the tree of life, you can almost imagine another tree of viral organisms laid over top of it but invisible to us in this image. They are small, as I said a moment ago. So this figure depicts sort of some very averaged size organisms or entities related to life. This could be an animal cell like one of our own, a eukaryotic cell about 10,000 nanometers or 10 micrometers across, a cell nucleus 2,800 nanometers or micrometers. The units for cellular life like this eukaryotic cell or a bacterial cell are actually kind of better described using the unit of micrometers. And so this would be an E. coli, and this may be an animal cell. And then all of these entities, these little things, would be different kinds of viruses. The bacteriophage are the viruses that can infect bacteria. Polio and parvovirus are animal viruses. Um, smallpox, rabies, influenza virus, and the different kinds of viruses that can cause the common cold, including a couple of different types of coronavirus, are all animal viruses. Tobacco mosaic virus is the first virus ever discovered back in 1892, and it's a virus that infects plants, specifically tobacco plants. So all of these viruses are really tiny, measurable in units of nanometers, and they were not um, something that we could actually see until the 1930s when we invented the electron microscope, which lets us look at details or at, at structures this tiny. Um, we only discovered that viruses existed before being able to see them when, when the work was first done on tobacco mosaic virus um, back in the 1890s because what happened is um, people filtered out all the other infectious py uh, particles, the cellular life particles, and then they saw that the filtrate was still able to cause disease. So they speculated that there was something tinier than cells in there that was infectious, and that was in fact the viruses. So that was a discovery made before we could even see these structures. Viruses can have a couple of different shapes. So they can be helical, or they can be icosahelical, and then sometimes there's a shape referred to as complex, and so if you're just looking at an enveloped virus, that's really a complex um, viral particle. The naked forms lack an 
envelope. And the envelope is shown here in purple. And what that is is it's a little bit of membrane stolen from the host cell as this virus exited the host cell that it had been replicating in and then that it lysed and escaped from. These little spikes are viral proteins embedded in the envelope on the outside. This is a structure you would see in coronaviruses or influenza viruses, for example. Some viruses are naked. They lack that envelope. So we just see the genome in purple in here, some purple spike proteins, and then all around here is a protein coating known as a capsid. Down here we have this helical shape, these helical shaped genomes, and they're also, there's also a capsid made out of little units called capsomeres, but the whole protein coating is called a capsid. Sometimes these helical structures can be enveloped in host membrane and something, sometimes not. When we're classifying viruses, the way that they get classified often depends on the person doing the classification and the reason that they're doing that classification. So if you were studying um, infectious disease and you were a clinician, you might classify or describe the virus according to what the disease was that it causes. So for example, you might describe the measles virus as the measles virus because it causes the disease known as measles. Or you might call or name or classify the virus according to its geography, its place of origin. So the Ebola virus came out of the Ebola region, the Ebola River region in Africa, and so the name Ebola stuck there. You might name it after the researcher that first discovered or described the virus, like the Epstein-Barr virus, or according to the shape or morphology of the virus, like the, the name coronavirus, which is named because these particles, we'll go back here for a minute, this kind of looks like the sun, right, or a star, or a, which goes to the Greek word corona. You might also describe or classify a virus that causes infection according to the body tissues of the host affected. For example, poliovirus can affect neurological tissue, so you could call it a neurotropic virus. Poliovirus also affects the GI tract, so it's also a, um, a virus that affects GI tissue or causes gastroenteritis. You could most commonly, probably the most universal and the, in some ways the best system for viral classification is to classify viruses according to what their genomes are composed of, whether they're DNA or RNA, and um, even better, is to look at how they use those genomes in order to make protein, which is the basis of a system for classification called the Baltimore system. So examples of DNA viruses are smallpox or chickenpox, and RNA viruses could be influenza, um, HIV, or poliovirus, or um, SARS-CoV-2 is also an RNA virus. A general viral life cycle, which in other words means a general replication cycle is shown here. So here we have an, an animal or a perhaps a plant virus, but we'll go with animal because I don't see much of a cell wall here. So this is supposed to be the animal host cell and this is the nucleus within it. So let's say this is a human cell and it's a cell that lines lung or respiratory tissue because here we see the virus named its influenza virus. So the influenza virus is attaching to the human cell, and influenza virus will attach specifically to the epithelial cells lining our respiratory tract. So that's step one. The virus has to attach to the host. This is an incredibly important step because it's this attachment that is always specific. It's the way that a virus meets and attaches to only the host that it is specifically able to infect. So the influenza virus is not going to attach to like your liver cells or um, the cells of your um, goldfish, any of the cells on your goldfish. It's going to attach only to certain categories of epithelial cells that are lined with protein receptors to which this influenza virus can bind. The attachment stage is important in the specificity between host and virus. Next step is the virus has to get inside, and that step is called penetration. 
and there are many different ways that viruses can get inside their host cell. Some of them are endocytosis. Stage 3 are, is called the uncoding stage, and in that the capsid gets broken and the viral contents, which is largely the viral chromosome or chromosomes, the viral genetic material gets released and then it's inside the host cell. Then what happens is that viral RNA or DNA, if this was a DNA virus, will take over the cell. And this is shown for as a diagram that relates to influenza virus. So in the influenza virus, what happens is the viral RNA will enter the nucleus. And once it gets in there, there's an RNA polymerase enzyme that will copy the virus. And then that copied um, viral genome gets utilized to make viral protein. So what happens in short is something called biosynthesis. So what happens in super short form, right, to really simplify this, the virus, the viral genetic material is inside the host cell and it forces the host cell to make more viral genetic material and viral protein. More genetic material and more protein. And those are the building blocks of the virus. So what happens then is those building blocks come together in a stage called assembly. And so during assembly what happens is the bits and pieces of the virus, the genetic material which is inside and the protein which is outside, they click together and form new little viral particles and they fill up the animal host cell and eventually they fill them up to the point where they are released and they exit the host cell. And often that release means that the host cell gets blown up or lysed and it will it will die as a result not in all cases but in many cases and that cell death is really problematic for the host organism so that's a like a generic of a viral life cycle this is the same idea shown here so here we have a host cell it's an animal cell and it's got a nucleus right and here's some dna virus like i don't know maybe polio virus okay and so the DNA containing, and it's an enveloped virus, it's got a membrane, so it comes up, it does step one, which is attachment. This virus will only be able to attach to this host cell if there are specific proteins that each have that control that attachment, that are a little bit like lock and key in that relationship. So just like any old key can't open any old lock, you have to have the right key for the right lock. So this is a very specific relationship. So attachment will happen, followed by penetration, that means the virus gets inside the host cell, followed by uncoding, which means break apart the capsid and release the viral genetic material, followed by synthesis or biosynthesis of new viral genome and viral proteins, viral genome equals viral genetic material, right? And that's what's happening in all of these arrows here. We're getting viral protein and we're getting more viral genetic material. The two will then come together in a stage called viral assembly, and that's happening here. Poof, we get a new virus made, and then that virus will bud or lice or be released from the cell. Sometimes, sometimes it's referred to as budding, not to be confused with the budding that is yeast cells replicating. This is viral budding. And this is only showing one virus coming out, but generally one virus goes in and then hundreds to thousands of viruses come out. So it's a one viral particle gets converted into hundreds to thousands of viral particles in one round of replication. That is really different than binary fission or the cellular rep replication that eukaryotic cells go through where one cell becomes two daughter cells. That's not happening here. One viral particle is becoming many, many viral particles. So you go from one to thousands in each round of replication. A little scary, right? If you think about that being a dangerous pathogen. Let's look at influenza or the flu. So influenza is the disease caused by influenza virus. And there are many different kinds of influenza viruses, although they're all very similar. So the influenza or the flu is a viral infection of the upper respiratory tract 
by influenza virus. And in particular, it targets cells that line our trachea and our bronchi. Some influenza viruses will penetrate a little bit more deeply into the lungs, um, but most target the trachea and the bronchi. The CDC estimates that, estimates that we have hundreds of thousands of flu infections every year in the United States and, you know, on average, about 20,000 deaths, although, for example, in the 2019-2020 flu season, that number was much closer to 80,000. So there can be years where there are a lot more deaths than this and years where there are fewer. Most of the deaths due to influenza predominantly happen in people who are older, so 65 and older, or people who have some sort of um, comorbidity or a problematic health condition, like they're immunosuppressed. Um, so it's particularly important to protect older people from the flu. Other reasons for death might be that you are co-infected with something else. For example, in 2020, we have to worry about co-infection between SARS-CoV-2 and influenza. Sadly, you can have both at the same time, and if that's the case, your likelihood of getting extremely ill is much higher. So that's something to worry about. Most of these deaths are actually due to the pneumonia that people get after infected with the flu virus. So there are a lot of terms to describe influenza, seasonal, pandemic, avian or bird, swine flu, and many, many more. So seasonal flu means the yearly flu outbreaks that we see, usually in our hemisphere late fall and winter into early spring. Of course, in the southern hemisphere, it would be flipped and it would be spring and summer that is flu season there. Pandemic flu means when we have a particularly nasty or virulent flu that spreads easily from person to person and it causes a global epidemic, epidemic being more cases of the flu than we would normally predict in any given year. Avian or bird flu refers to the idea or the reality, in fact, that flu is due to a virus originating in wild birds. Um, and some of the flus that have been particularly problematic have emerged from wild birds and moved into human populations. So these sorts of flu viruses are definitely zoonotic or able to infect humans and non-human animal hosts. Um, swine flu is referring to a flu that was transmitted to humans from pigs, and it may actually have originated in birds, but the animal that it came into humans from um, was pigs. And again, these would all be zoonotic viruses, able to infect more than just humans. So the flu is caused by influenza virus, and influenza viruses are single-stranded RNA viruses. There are three categories of them, and I won't really get into those here. Type A's tend to be the ones that are most deadly, but often B's can be very problematic as well. C is seen rarely in human infections. A thing about the influenza virus is that it is an enveloped RNA virus, and out of that envelope uh, poke a bunch of spike proteins. One of the proteins is called hemagglutinin, and that is the protein that's responsible for allowing influenza virus to attach to human epithelial cells at a specific receptor protein. Um, there's also a spike protein called neuraminidase. It helps with getting into and, and like penetrating and uncoding for this viral life cycle. And then the flu genome itself is segmented. It consists of many different chromosomes and they're shown as little coils here. And so that's all I'm going to say about the flu virus because I've given you other content in that regard. And that concludes today's introduction to the viruses.